go with from there. The first one is, I will make you a great nation. Now, you have to stick around for a while. But eventually, you get all the way through the kings to David to Solomon. And you have a description of King Solomon and his kingdom that sounds like it rivals any kingdom on the earth at that time. And this would be something that they would be pointing to. But that is just a taste of what God has planned for the nation of Israel. See, oftentimes we forget to look at the Bible prophecy and see that there will be a day when the nation of Israel will actually possess all of the lands that God has given them. They never possessed all those lands. All the territory that God gave them when He gave them the promise that you'll go to this land and it will be from this boundary to this boundary. They've, they've never possessed it all, but they will. Amen. The day is coming. And so these promises are still in effect. It says, uh, those who bless you, now I'm going to bless you and make your name great. And so if you think about his experience, as you go through the rest of this material, you're going to see how God intervened in his situation to bless him. Did he deserve it? No, we're going to see some circumstances that you're going to say, he did what? He said what? He went where? And just like you and I as followers of Jesus Christ are in this redemptive story, you see Abram's descendant that we're going to see in these promises uh, is going to be a blessing to the whole world. We're a part of that blessing. And so if that's the case, then it doesn't mean that it's because of his perfection or his good works that he earned this relationship with God. But it was, as the scripture tells us, because of his faith. And so we're called today not to be saved by the works of the law. You cannot be saved by the works of the law, but by trusting in, putting our faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, I'll bless those who bless, curse those who curse you. That's number three. And then four, and you, all the nations of the earth, will be blessed. All the nations of the earth. How does that happen? Well, there has to be something that comes from his descendants that's going to be a blessing. You can say, well, it's because the major world religions all point back to him. And so, you know, Judaism points back to him. Christianity points back to him. Uh, Islam points back to him. Uh, and all that. so that's got to be it. No, it's not really it at all. Because the scripture doesn't acknowledge that Judaism is correct unless you have Jesus Christ as the Messiah. It certainly doesn't acknowledge any truth in Islam because one of the key components of Islam is that there's one God and he has no son. And of course, the scripture tells us if anybody denies the son, they deny the father also. They don't have the right God. So it's not that. You know, the blessing that's talking about that comes to the whole earth goes back to the message where we talked about the fact in the book of Revelation, you have a moment where everybody is worshiping God and they're worshiping God from every tribe and every tongue, from every nation on the face of the earth. There are people who have been saved because of the work of Jesus Christ for us on the cross as He bore our sin and He took our punishment that we might have His righteousness. And so that's how all the nations of the earth are blessed in that sense. And so that includes the Gentiles and God's redemptive work. And so was God, is He just been, let me try this, oh that didn't work, let me try something else. Oh that didn't work. Has He just been trying to patch up His plan along the way? Well no, if you look at the, the story of the scripture, the, the record of the word of God, what you see is that God has been consistently at work and he has found this line, this place that he has been able to find a person or a group of people throughout history to carry the message of who the one true God really is and of his love for his people. Now today, we want to make an application of this to us. 
And I wanted you to look, if you would, with me to uh, Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians 3, verse 8. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. All the things I just said come from that passage right there. That is really the connection to Abraham. That is where the blessing is. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Abraham, the believer, what well, did Abraham believe in Jesus? Well, Abraham believed in the promise of the word of God that God was going to send one who would come, who would crush the serpent's head when his heel was bruised. And so that was the message that they had, that they had passed down, that there was going to be this one who would come. So as much as they knew about Messiah, as much as they knew about the work of God, that God was not finished, that God had made a promise, and God always kept His promises. Did the flood show that God kept His promise? Yes. And it showed that He promised there was going to be a flood, and it came. Those who survived, did they believe God kept His promise when... The next time it rained, the rainbow came out and they had the promise there. God is not going to destroy the earth by water again. And so they, the promises of God are going to be fulfilled. For you and for me, we will see all the promises of God be completed. And so we shouldn't become complacent or fearful or anxious about how things are going to turn out because of the reality that God is still at work. To bring people to himself and to accomplish his purposes. Now if you'll notice in uh, verse 11, it says, now, now that no one is justified by law before God is evident, the righteous man shall live by faith. That is what was said about Abraham. The righteous man shall live by faith. And so now today, if you are a person like I was, uh, before I came to faith in Christ, I, I was uh, growing up in the church, and I was in Sunday school and, and all these different things. My parents made sure I was there, and uh, I, you know, sometimes even read my lesson. Imagine that. And I had my envelope, and I had checked as I was present. I had my offering. And you remember when we used to do all those things? I see you had to go on like that. Yeah, I read your lesson. And so, you know, you get there, and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. The problem was, is I was lost as I could be. Still dead in trespasses and sins. Still living my life for myself, my own way. As simple as that was at my age at the time. And really, thinking God is okay, but I don't like this whole thing about Jesus and about having to turn your life over to Him. Because I really just kind of want to do what I want to do. And so that reality kept me separated from every good and perfect gift that God had planned for me. Because I was satisfied to roll in my sin and, my, and the death that I was in as a person apart from God. I was not a part of God's work. I was not a, God of, a part of God's plan in my experience. Even though God knew that I would someday respond. I was not being blessed by. And if I had died before I had come to faith in Christ, I know. I know where I would have gone. There were times I laid in my bed and simply thought about as a, as a child who knew the gospel, knew I needed to respond. I would hear on Mississippi Gulf Coast. I would hear jets taken off from Gulfport headed to New Orleans or back. I would hear that roar as I was just falling asleep and I would wake up and think, is that the Lord? Now you talk about conviction. And yet, I was convinced of my need for Christ, convinced that I was a sinner, and convinced that I wasn't going to do what God wanted me to do. I was just going to do my own thing. And it wasn't until one day when I was sitting in a worship service, just like this, that I came to the realization that my life wasn't so great that I wanted to risk missing everything that God had planned for my life and for my eternity. 
And I responded to the call of Jesus. And, and I encourage you to, to do the same thing. That God will graciously work in your life to save you as well. And so as you look at this passage, it says then we're going to live by faith, not by our own good deeds. However, the law is, is not of faith. On the contrary, who, pra who practices them, the law, shall live by them. That's to say that if you think you're going to do a good job of just being a good person, then you better be perfect. You better be absolutely sinless. You say, oh, it's too late. Nah, nah. You need Jesus because if you're going to try to make it by the law, you have to practice the law perfectly. Did anybody practice the law perfectly? Yeah. Jesus did. And so by putting your faith and trust in what He has done in Him and turning your life over to Him, then you can be counted in on the righteousness that is true of Jesus alone. Now, look in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. There you go. Having become a curse for us, He took my sin. He took the sin of the world upon Himself. He took that curse on Himself. Having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Why? In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And this is not to say that God has no intention to save the Jews. In fact, Paul deals with that on, on a, a very careful basis in the book of Romans. He's not finished with them. He's still using them. He is still going to accomplish His purpose and make them a great nation. And the scripture tells us that when the Lord returns, that they're going to see Him and they have pierced and they're going to weep. There's going to be repentance in Israel. That the men will repent with the men and the women with the women. And, and this whole response to the reality that Jesus really was who He said He was. But this is not just for that one nation. You see, God is preparing to receive for himself children that he has adopted. Those who will respond to the gospel. Jewish origin. People that he's going to make a kingdom. And priests. There's people of both Jew and Gentile that are going to be, as a group, referred to as the bride of Christ. And you are... Right here, hearing about the redemptive work of God, and if you've not responded, God is calling you to that purpose. So, what is your choice? What is your decision? You see, God knows. You can't help it. He's God. By foreknowledge, He knows how people are going to respond. And yet, He's given you the opportunity to hear the gospel and the free will to choose to respond to do life His way. And all we can do today is tell you this great love. And encourage you to respond, even as each and every one of us, all sinners saved by grace, have responded for nothing more special than any other person except for the fact that God has done a work in our life. And we call you to allow Him to do that redemptive work in yours as well. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have one more passage we want to look at before we go. And that is from Philippians chapter 1. When you struggle, when you wonder if you're going to make it. I'm not talking about a person who is realizing that maybe they've not been saved and they do need to respond. Even though you've been baptized in the church and you went to Bible school all your life and you've been in Sunday school and all those things like I did when I was a kid, you can still be lost. Now I'm talking about those who have seen the evidence, the work of the Spirit in their life to confirm to them that they are in fact the child of God. They have sincerely responded to the gospel. And yet there are days when you just want if you're going to be able to make it in all the things that you have to do. Here is a promise that God has made to you. This is surely as He made a promise. To Abraham, he has made this promise to you. Paul says this, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus.
not going to give up. He doesn't give up on us. His great love and His graciousness are poured out in the lives of His children. And so whatever it is that we're going to walk through, whatever things we're going to face, this work that He has started in us because of our faith and trust in Jesus is something that He is going to perfect, complete, the idea of completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Why just until then? Because on the day that Christ Jesus appears, we will see the completion of our sanctification process. We will be glorified and we will stand in His glory in resurrection bodies and sin and all of those temptations and problems and struggles that we've had in the past. Every physical difficulty that we've had. Every mental struggle that we've worked with along the way. Every one of those things will be gone. And we shall be like Him, like God. But in our thoughts, in our ways, in our character, we shall be like Him. So brothers and sisters, don't give up. Don't despair. And remember that God is at work. And how do you respond to it? 1 John chapter 5 tells us the way that we show God our love. It's not by saying, God, I love you, God, I love you. There's nothing wrong with that if it's a sin. But what 1 John 5 tells us is the way that we show God our love is by obedience. It's by trusting Him enough to live our life. His way and not our own. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to show you our love. We'll never do that well enough to come anywhere near what you have done for us already and what you plan to do for us throughout the rest of our life and throughout eternity. But we thank you for it.